Welcome to the Super Abundant Life Podcast, where we teach the Bible in a simple, authentic, and practical way so that Christians can skillfully apply the Word of God to create supernatural results in every area of life. This is your host, Olaomi Bridgway. I'm going to be talking about something that is very relevant <laughs> to us in today's world. Maybe not just in today's world, but in all the worlds that may have existed even before today's world. Something basically what I'm saying is that is very pertinent to us and it is about living joyfully. And I've titled this, How to Find Joy in the Present on Your Way to the Preferred. So how do you live in today's world with the vision of the future that you want? And I think this is really interesting for us as Christians, simply because Christianity is a vision focused movement. I mean, Christ was always talking to them about eternal life in my kingdom, in heaven, etc. So Jesus was always painting the glorious future of the disciples and for us as a church he was always showing us what was to come and because christianity tends to take on that sort of stance regarding life it is very easy for us as christians to sort of get trapped in the whole okay this is what god has told me this is the promise that i'm standing on or i haven't seen it yet concerning my career marriage children purpose this ministry health and all those different kinds of things and it's very easy for us to get sort of trapped in the whole this thing hasn't happened yet and it steals our joy so what that's what i want to talk about today because as i've said many times on this podcast this is something that i believe with all of my heart that peace and joy are the normal state of the christian and the bible makes us very very aware of that peace and joy as a christian those are your normal natural states of being that doesn't mean that we don't experience situations or circumstances that may come and punctuate and momentarily pull us out of that state of peace and joy. Of course, that's going to happen. However, we should develop ourselves, first of all, having the mindset that being in a prolonged state of dissatisfaction, sadness, depression, no joy, no peace, anxiety, worry, fear, that is not the will of God for our lives. So it starts with us, first of all, acknowledging that no, 98% of the time I should be at peace and I should have joy that is supplied by the Holy Spirit, regardless of what is going on in my circumstance. But like I said, here's the agitation. We all have things that we are reaching out for. Every time you tune in on Sunday in sermon, your pastor will be showing you about, you know, this is a kind of like painting a picture and rightfully so of the life that God has called you to calling you higher. Every time you have your devotional, you hang out with God, you pray with other Christians or whatever it is. There are things that are staring you up towards your preferred future. Now, how do you hold on to that vision of your preferred future? whilst living in the present and enjoying living in the present. So, so if this is an agitation that you have struggled with or experienced, then you certainly want to listen to this podcast today. Now, this episode is particularly important to me because this is something that I literally have to do almost every day. And I'll explain why. The kind of person that I am, Okay, and I, I'll start off. So I'm already, I've already started teaching basically. <laughs> you can sort of broadly categorize people into two spheres. Now, like I said, broadly, okay, <laughs> broadly, very, very broad categorization, all right. <laughs> But essentially, you can sort of categorize people into two broad categories, which is one the pragmatist and the visionary. Now, the pragmatist, all right, I'll just read out who a pragmatist is based on dictionary definitions, etc. A pragmatist usually has a straightforward, matter of fact approach and doesn't let emotion distract her. 
So this is ideal. A lot of us sort of live in between. Nobody is entirely a pragmatist and nobody is entirely a visionary, which is the second one. A pragmatist is someone who is concerned more with matters of fact than with what could or should be. A pragmatist person's realm is results and consequences. So in other words, just to simplify that in plain language, essentially a pragmatist is someone that would literally base their decisions more on what is and what has been. So pragmatists tend to live based on that connection between the past and the present. You tell the pragmatist, I want to go for this particular career move. I want to apply for this job. And a pragmatist will look at you and look at your CV and say, but look at your experience in the past and actually your current experience. It doesn't really show that you are able to reach for that. That's too far for, for you, right? Why don't you aim for something smaller? And based on that, you can then now climb. They come up with practical solutions based on what has been and what is based on what is revealed. There's nothing wrong with being a pragmatist. So the way I've described it, you might be thinking, ah, I don't want to be a pragmatist though. <laughs> Okay, visionaries need pragmatists. I'm going to come and talk about visionaries in a moment because if the world is full of visionaries, everybody's head will be in the clouds and nothing really would get done to a certain degree. So a pragmatist really basically looks at what is and what has been and they're able to come up with very, very practical steps to move forward based on facts. Okay, so let me go on to the visionary and then I will then explain how this Two, living on either side can actually be a trap for us. And what I'm going to do in today's podcast is show you another way, a completely unique way that will help you and literally you will escape the trap of being disappointed and being discouraged all the time simply because you don't see what it is that you desire working out exactly for you in that moment. So a visionary, according to the definition, says is someone with a strong vision of the future. Visionaries see the bigger picture in every action, literally in everything. And I'm a visionary, okay, primarily. Now, as I said, the reason why this particular podcast is important to me is because I'm training myself daily. I don't take it for granted that, okay, I'm now, because my natural tendency is to literally dwell on the side of visionary 100% of the time. In everything, I always see the future. I see vision. Like any, my, my children would do something instead of just saying, okay, okay, me, I'll be seeing 10 years from now. What could happen if this, blah, blah, blah. I'm always literally looking to the future. It's my natural tendency. It's where I was wired. So a visionary is someone who, with a strong vision of the future, visionaries see the bigger picture in every action. They think creatively and imaginatively about the future. She is someone who has unusual or progressive ideas about the future and the present. You can recognize a visionary for her ability to envision the future. Now, here's a downside of that. Since such visions aren't always accurate, they might be overstated a lot of times and they may completely miss the mark. A visionary's ideas may either work brilliantly or fail miserably. Now you can see why the visionary needs a pragmatist because the visionary will come and say, hey, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to build a tower that reaches the heavens. The pragmatist will come and say, well, if you look at the Bible, when the people of the Tower of Babel tried to do it, <laughs> God came and scattered all of them. So I don't think that is going to work. All right. So, so sometimes the visionary has all these ideas, grandiose, massive ideas. She needs a pragmatist in her life to be able to sort of temper her down a little bit and say, uh, okay, I know you want to fly, but let's start with crawling seems because you've just come out of the womb, something like that. Meanwhile, a pragmatist needs a visionary in her life because the pragmatist has a way of just literally settling as in, okay, um, this is what has been, this is what is possible based on what has already happened. So the visionary will come and say, yes, I know that. Okay. Um, at a point, nobody had ever, you know, run hundred meters in under 10 seconds. The pragmatist will say it's not possible. Look at history. Nobody has ever done it, but the dreamer, the visionary will say, yes, I know, but look at it. I'm sure it is possible. I'm sure one day somebody will be running, etc., etc. So they need each other. 
So why have I taken the time to describe these two sets of people? Now, the problem, right, with the pragmatist as related to joy and being able to live in joy perpetually as a child of God is this. The pragmatist looks at life. They, Like I said, they look at life from the lens of past and present. Now, if you only live in the past and into the present, the problem is you will not have that excitement, that exuberance of wanting to approach life, of wanting to go out and enjoy life because things will literally become so mundane and you'll be like, is this all there is to life? You know, that kind of thing. Do you understand that? So being too much of a pragmatist has its downsides and it can cause people to just have this thing they're longing for that they can't even articulate and it keeps them in that place of, well, there's, I don't see anything really happening, um, in this situation. And also someone that is a visionary can actually get boxed into becoming a pragmatist based on life experiences. So someone that has been fighting a certain situation and longing for change after a while, they'll say, well, I've tried over all these years. I haven't seen anything change. And they sort of settle there in that place of discomfort and discouragement and dissatisfaction. And as a result of that, they're not living in joy. Going over to the side of the visionary, the visionary has grand pictures of the future. Now you would think that would keep them excited. However, because again, they're living in the present a little bit, but mostly in the future, they are constantly discouraged because they'll be like, uh -uh, I see what I'm seeing, see what is, why can't it move faster, etc., etc., And that literally will steal their joy. Okay. So that's my definition of the pragmatist and the visionary. I have very strong visionary tendencies. And so that is why sometimes, uh, not sometimes I intentionally surround myself with people that are pragmatists and also visionaries because you need both of them in your life. Now, the second thing I'm going to talk about is actually define what joy is because there's a difference between happiness and joy. Yeah. So happiness quite simply is externally motivated by situations that are often beyond your control. So somebody walks up to you and says, um, here's, uh, 20,000 pounds. I just like you. And I want to give you this money. You'll be happy. Abby, we know you'll be happy. Like, wow, really? That's amazing. Thank you. Or your child comes home from school and says, Oh, look, mom, end of term results. I got all A stars, etc." You'll be happy. Your husband comes home and surprises you with flowers. You'll be happy. Your boss calls you into the office and says, I've seen how well you've been working. You know, I'm so impressed with you. We're looking at the next board meeting. We're reviewing everything and we're going to promote you and increase your salary, blah, 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 and all that stuff. So it's externally motivated by things most of the time that you have no control over. So if you have no control over those factors and those external situations, that is why happiness cannot literally be what you are banking on to sustain you because you don't know when things will come that will make you happy. Do you see what I mean? Even when you say, oh, I'm intentionally going to go and look for things to make you happy. They are short lived. So you say, okay, um, going on, you know, spa day makes me happy being pampered self care. You know, when they're doing all that stuff and massages and all that stuff makes me happy. You go and do, you go and deliberately search for that external experience that will make you happy. By the time you drive back home, maybe give yourself another 30 minutes. The thing has fizzled out. Do you see what I mean? So it's always externally motivated. So as a Christian, we are not supposed to live in search of happiness and be fueled by happiness. Joy is what the Holy Spirit promises us as a fruit of the spirit. And joy is internally driven by a conscious set of decisions and actions. So joy comes from within. It is supplied by the Holy Spirit. It is not an external thing. Joy rises from within you. That is why you will find people, and this is where I'm trying to get you to through this podcast, that are going through 
horrible situations in their lives. They look like things are not working for them and they're full of joy. And it's not fake smiles. They are genuinely joyful. Like they're the ones that are encouraging people that even have a lot more going for them. Do you see what I mean? So joy is independent of your external situations. It is internally motivated or generated by the power that the Holy Spirit supplies. And it is a conscious acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit within you. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. There's a formula that I use. I have not seen this anyway. It is something literally that the Holy Spirit taught me because, hmm, like I said, nah, visionary kind of person. Oh, I mean, it is, <laughs> it is very easy for me to, very easy, extremely easy for me to fall into the, oh, I'm dissatisfied. Why is, why are things not working and lose perspective completely? lose perspective completely simply because no matter what I am, where I am, what I'm doing, I always have pictures of a grand vision. It's just the way I'm wired. Sometimes I'm like, God, stop showing me all this. I don't want to see. Leave me. Let me just even do something. But that's how he wired me. So it works. And I've also taught it to my coaching clients and also help them walk through it. Right? So if you're someone that is quite driven, highly driven this is going to help you on the other hand if you're someone that is more practical like a realist and you just feel like okay let me just live life as it is as whatever comes it comes we'll deal with it and that is making you feel like you're not getting the most out of life this will also help you as well okay so the next thing i'm going to talk about now this podcast actually is in four or five parts, four parts. I've talked about two. I'm going to talk about the next one now. Why? All right. What actually leads us to the point where we are living with persistent or perpetual sadness, dissatisfaction, or even depression? What causes that? What leads to that? And there are three different ways that that can happen. And I'm going to talk about each one also going into the Bible to show you a specific character that lived their life like that. And as a result of that, it did not work out well for them. So the first way, so if you find yourself constantly dissatisfied or feeling depressed or just sad, where it's just moments of happiness, like something happened and you're happy. And then after that, you're just unhappy again and sad, et cetera, et cetera. You may want to locate yourself in one of these three areas that I'm going to talk about. And once you locate yourself, it's a good thing. You can then say, okay, I'm going to take the strategy that allow me is going to share and I'm going to make my way from where I am currently to where I know that I want to be, which is living joyfully, right? 99% of the time you have joy. Okay. Let's say 80%. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So why do we find ourselves in season, prolonged season of sadness, dissatisfaction, or even depression? The first way we get there is by living predominantly in the present, living predominantly in the present. You know, those people that say live in the moment, you know, do all this, this, this. I get to, I understand. But if you only live in the moment, I will show you now why that is not the way to go. Okay. That's certainly not the way to go. Living purely in the moment or predominantly in the present is not the way to go. Do you know why? Anyone that lives their life like that, they lose perspective. There's no perspective. Life becomes so routine and mundane that despair can set in. So I want you to think about somebody that has a job. Okay, so they've been at this job for a while and there's really no vision of the future concerning their career or where that job is taking them. I'm sure you've been there. I mean, a lot of us have experienced that where you are in a job and it seems like it's a dead end. It doesn't seem to be leading into anything, right? So as a result of that, you don't have a clear picture of, okay, this is where my career is going. 
I want you to think about that job and how you show up and how almost every day you'll be like, oh my God, you mean I have to go to this place again? It creates despair. That's because they can, they don't have any feature, any vision, any clear vision of what is coming, like a coming attraction that is in front of them. And also in that situation, it is very easy for the person to lose perspective of where they're coming from, of the past, of how far they've come. I, like I said, I'm going to give an example from the Bible. So this will help crystallize it because I'm going to paint an image to help you understand what I mean by living predominantly in the present. Now think about Judas. My example from the Bible is Judas. Judas was so lured by how the 30 pieces of silver would improve his life in the present that he forgot he forgot the three and a half years of glory he had experienced with Jesus. And he was also willing to forfeit the promise of eternal life in the future. Do you understand that? So this guy had walked with Jesus for three and a half years. He had seen all the miracles. I mean, you wonder how can you see all those things and then still go and collect 30 pieces of silver? That's an example of someone that is living predominantly for today living predominantly in the moment their consciousness the things that they think about the most is what am i experiencing today what's my mind like today how are my kids performing today okay what am i experiencing at work is the work going well is the project causing me stress just literally encumbered most of the time by what they're experiencing in the present life that is a very depressing place to live in right so judas looked at his life and thought I don't have, I want money. My life can be better now. And literally that obsessive drive to live in the present, to make his present situation better, caused him to forget that, uh -uh, see this person, this is Jehovah now, this is the Messiah. And also the promise of the better future. He didn't have a clear vision of what was to come in front of him as well. Because if he had retained the promise of eternal life and put it in front of him and literally not just lived in the present, but also in the future and in the past, which is the ideal way, he would not have done what he did. But it was like, no, 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 I want the money now. I want the money now. And he literally went and betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and he never helped him, right? It did not help him. So delayed gratification is not on the list of people that live predominantly in the present. They'll keep going after experiences to improve or make themselves feel better in the now, but those experiences are actually short-lived and because it is short-lived, they end up feeling worse. So I can imagine that when the 30 pieces of silver hit Judas's hand, you'll be like, wow, I'm rich. But like five or 10 minutes later, He'd be like, what have I done? Oh, this money. Do you, do you understand? So it actually creates more despair, right? Chasing experiences just to make myself feel better in the moment. And that is all that counts. So you, you have to take an audit and say, my resources, my money, my time, my efforts, etc., my energy. How am I spending these resources that God has given me? If most of your resources predominantly, I want to say by the time you're getting to 60%, right? 60%, 70%, that's predominantly now. If 60 to 70% and God forbid, oh, 90, 99% of your resources are going towards your present. Like, I just want to buy that bag now. I just want to do this one now. Okay, I want to watch Netflix now or whatever it is. You are not thinking about what investment can I make into the future or keeping an anchor to your past. And I'll explain what that means. Okay. So it doesn't work. So let's move on to the second reason why we find ourselves in those prolonged seasons of sadness, dis dissatisfaction, or even depression. The second one is living predominantly in the past living predominantly in the past. There are two ways, two main ways that this can play out. So people that live predominantly in the past, first way is 
they keep longing for the good old days. You hear them talk about how when I was this or when I was that, when my career was flying, or before I had kids, or before I got married, or when I was a Christian on university, when I was this and this, they're always talking about the glory days that have gone. <laughs> so in a way, they have a distorted view of the past. And I'll tell you why that is. So it's not just longing for the good old days or the glory days gone by. The reason, so I'm telling you now so that you can look, <laughs> you can locate yourself and they say, ah, you mean this is the reason why we do this thing. I'll tell you why that is. The reason people do that is actually to escape the demands of the present and of the future. Let me explain what I mean. So somebody literally looks at that career and they say, oh, my career is just stalled, etc., etc." And they keep looking back and saying, oh, the good old days when, you know, I had that promotion in the first three years of my career. See how I got 50 million promotions. Of course, an exaggeration. <laughs> I got, five, I got 50 million promotions. And then since year four, up I mean year 10 now, I've not even moved forward. I've just, my salary has increased a little bit, etc., etc." And rather listen carefully to what i'm saying rather than sit down and say hey what is going on oh no? between year four and year ten where it's only in fact no promotion and only a tiny increase in my salary instead of them to assess the present and say there's something wrong and then put in the work to change that present into a glorious future they are like, no, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to think about that. That is too much for me. It makes me feel depressed. So they'll keep going back to quote and unquote the good old days. And as a result of that, they never really move forward. And guess what happens when you're not moving forward? God created us to be progressive beings. So any human being that is not progressively moving forward, you are going to be sad. You can have moments of happiness. You can chase happiness and have experiences externally. Like I said, go to the spa, okay, go out, go shopping, go and watch a movie and all those things. These are momentarily points of happiness that fizzle away very quickly. The joy that keeps you sustained on this journey of life is internally driven. So because they keep looking back to the good old days and the glory days, like, ah, come and see when I was so hot. Etc. Now I don't even know what's going on with this body. <laughs> but you can change the body now. In your future, you can be hot again. Do you see what I mean? So that is one way that this plays out. And of course, the kings of living in the past. Who? The children of Israel in the wilderness. I love those guys. Well, I don't love them as my mentors. <laughs> of visions of people I follow. But in terms of studying, I love, I love studying it because if we, if truth be told, there's so much of us that was in those guys, the way they approached life, the way they related with God, we honestly, so I let, I take so many lessons from those guys. So the children of Israel, I read something to you about why it is honestly not good to live predominantly in the past, one expression is the good old days. Numbers 11, from four to six says, then the foreign rabble who were traveling Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. So they were like, ah, the good things of, this was when they had come out to, God had delivered them with a strong hand to come into the wilderness. So they began to crave the good things of Egypt and the people of Israel began to complain. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. We had all the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic we wanted. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna, manna, manna. What is this manna? I love these guys. You can see why I love these guys. They're like, what is this man? What is this? I want onion and leeks and, and cucumber, four things. <laughs> I want meat. Can you see how literally the view of the quote and unquote good old days is actually distorted? Completely distorted. Why? Because they don't want to face the present. The manner was meant to be something temporary. God did not want them to live in the wilderness. It was meant to be a short journey. The manner was just something to give them enough energy so they don't faint. 
and then give them the strength to literally charge and go and take Canaan where it was a land that was flowing with milk and honey. So they didn't like the current situation in the wilderness. They were facing it and saying, okay, we know it's just it's temporary. Now, what do we need to do to and take charge of the promised land? No, they did not want to deal with it. They didn't want to access it emotionally because they're like, this is too hard. It's called escapism. Good old, if you keep, if you find yourself always talking about the good old days, it is escapism. Honestly, it is. It is that you're not facing the truth. It is escapism. So they were like, oh, people that were slaves. People, I, I see, I want to try and imagine how harshly, how wickedly, if there's such a word like that, that Pharaoh dealt with these guys. And they were like, oh, we ate fish and meat free. How, how is that possible? It's not true. It really is not true. It's not true. Do you understand that? <laughs> so they were so focused on their past that they became blinded to what God was doing in the present and they ridiculed the future that he was showing them. This is just going, you know, to wilderness, eating manna and going to take the promised land. It's too much. It's too much. Giants. I don't want to deal with giants. Let me just go back. The second way that this living predominantly in the past can play out is living with regret looking back again remember it's a distorted view so you look at your career now you say oh look at my age i am over 40 see where i'm in my career if only i had finished with a 2-1 when i was at university distorted view because you will not ask up to 10 people that are doing extremely well in that career and you say what did you finish school with you won't need to go to 10 people before you find at least two that didn't finish with two one and are doing fantastically in that career do you see what i mean so living with regret and finding situations in the past that you felt like okay i should have done better or this person should have done better sometimes it's not even you you hold somebody in bondage and say if only this person had not done this if only this person had done this my life would be different now this present situation that i'm not liking i don't want to think about it. i don't want to deal with it i'm going to live predominantly in the past Okay, and as I said, my case study for this is the children of Israel. So this is where they specifically actually display this in Numbers 14, 1 to 4. And remember the Bible says in Hebrews eleven fifteen that if they had, talking about Abraham and all the patriarchs, if they had been mindful of the country that they came out of, if they had lived predominantly in the country that God called them out of, they would have created opportunities or found occasion to return. So anyone that is living predominantly in the past is stuck in the past. You can't move forward, right? So he says in Numbers 14, 1 to 4, then the whole community began weeping aloud. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest. <laughs> These guys. Against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in Egypt. Or even here in the wilderness, they complained. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted amongst themselves, let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. What created that reaction in them? When God showed them and said, okay, well, you're at the edge of the wilderness now. Go and send spies into the promised land, Canaan, to spy it. They looked at it and said, ah, this vision is big. Old. Ah, this opposition to get to improve this career to where I really want. Honestly, it's a lot of work. It is better for me to excuse it and say, if only something in my past had been different, I would not be here today. It's a lie. It's escapism. It's escapism. It's not allowing to face and, and guard themselves or with strength and say, let's go. Like Joshua and Caleb did. They said, no, it, it's better to go back. Let's go back. Literally what Hebrews eleven fifteen says. Okay. Now, the third way, obviously, I'm talking about the past, present, and future. So the third way that we get trapped in prolonged seasons of sadness, of discouragement, disappointment, dissatisfaction, depression is if the person is inordinately future focused. And I have already confessed my sins to you in the beginning of this podcast that me, this is my own inordinately future focused. That is why every single day there are things that I do and I'm going to share with you. I have to do these things. Otherwise my life would just be one long blur of sadness and discouragement. I'm telling you that. So 
This person that is inordinately future focused, they're always seeing what could be. The preferred, and as a reason, they miss the beauty of life in the present. And they will also find themselves having this constant feeling of inadequacy and lack, which creates sadness. Because they're always like, oh, that's what it's supposed to be. Now, if 80% of your thoughts or 90 or anything like that, inordinately feature focus, like I said, is about, oh, this is, I want to be better. I want to be this. I want this to do this. I want my children to be this. I want this job to be this, etc., etc. Et you still have to live in the present, Abby, and you still have the memories of your past. So it, it just becomes so depressing, like, oh, nothing is happening, like, which is not true. So it skews somebody's perspective of what is truly, they don't have a big picture of the whole thing, putting everything into a mix. Now, let me show you, like I said, I'm giving examples from the Bible of people that lived in each of these categories. And this one is Saul, Saul the king, not Saul the, that turned to Paul. <laughs> so Saul the king. And I'll read something to you and then I'll explain what I mean. First Samuel 20 from verse 30 to verse 34. So to give some context to what happened just before that, this was when Jonathan had literally just helped David to escape. So Saul wanted to kill David and had plotted to have him attend a dinner. But his plan was as soon as David showed up at that dinner, <laughs> he was going to put his spear right into his heart. So Jonathan plotted with David to let David escape. And then Jonathan came and made his excuses to Saul and said, oh, uh, sorry, father. Oh, the reason why David can't be here today is because I sent him on an errand. So that's literally what happened just before this. And now says that Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan. Look at what he called his own son. He said, you stupid son of a whore. He swore at him. Do you think I don't know that you want him to be king in your place, shaming yourself and your mother? Such strong words. Let me keep reading, then I'll explain. It says, as long as that son of Jesse is alive, you will never be king. Can you see how Saul's entire, fo his whole body, his whole spiritual and body, is focused on future like this dynasty must not end with me my son must be king he was inordinately focused on the future he said now go and get him so i can kill him can you imagine so go and bring this <laughs> go and bring him joy i want to kill him <sighs> and then jonathan was like oh my god what is wrong with this man he said but why should he be put to death what has he done what has he done? So Jonathan is trying to bring his father back into the present. Like, what is, how has David offended you? What has merited this idea that you must kill him? Literally, what, what's going on now in the present that warrants this reaction to David? He's trying to pull him back to say, have some perspective. No, now look at what happened. I have to. Read. This doesn't really. I don't need to read this to explain what I want to explain. But this is such good storytelling. <laughs> it is beautiful entertainment. So he said, "What has he done?" Then Saul hurled his spear at Jonathan, intending to kill him. Can you imagine? So at last, Jonathan realized that his father was really determined to kill David. Jonathan left the table in fierce anger and refused to eat on that second day of the festival, for he was crushed by his father's shameful behavior toward David. So he was even so focused on the future, like this man that has been anointed by God said, this guy cannot be king, that his rage took over him and he was even going to kill the person that was supposed to take over the throne. So how did Saul get it wrong? In two ways. He was so focused on the future. This dynasty must not end. My son must be king. Even if he's not Jonathan, so another son would take it. Uh, somebody from the house of Saul is going to be king. We must last 50 generations in this place of kingship. Which means that, like Jonathan was saying, he was literally forgetting the present situation. Like this guy is serving you with everything he has. He's serving you. David currently in the present situation is one of your most loyal subjects. He, he's not hearing any of that. And he's also forgetting his past. 
as to how the reason why he became king is not because he was born into kingship, it's because God appointed him. So if God appointed him, then God has every right to appoint somebody else. So by losing focus or sight of where he came from and what is happening currently, literally this guy went off the rails. You can see why I'm telling you that I take this thing seriously. He went off the rails and eventually was destroyed. Saul was so driven by the future of his throne, so inordinately living in the future, that he forgot where he had come from, who appointed him, and the compromises he was now making or the person that he was becoming in the present. So those are the three ways that we end up in a place where there's prolonged seasons of sadness, where you're just sad, where you can't even enjoy what you have. Do you see? Okay. Finally, I'm going to take the time now. It's a very simple principle and I'll explain exactly what I do, how to find joy in the present on your way to your preferred future. And I call this the threefold chord principle, because the Bible says that a threefold chord, I believe it's in Ecclesiastes, cannot be easily broken. So a one-fold chord, if there's such a thing, is easily broken. A two-fold chord, by inference, is easily broken. But a threefold chord is not easily broken. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So let me explain what I mean by that. The way that you can escape this trap of being unhappy and sad and lacking joy in your life and not being and not living 80 to 100 percent of your time in peace and joy, as God has prescribed for us, is here's a key. Here's a secret not to live in the past predominantly, not to live in the present predominantly, not to live in the future predominantly, as I've explained, but to actually anchor yourself at all times in the past, in the present, and the future. That's what I mean by the threefold chord. In the past, in the present, and in the future. So not two alone, not past and present. That's a pragmatist. I told you that does not work. Not present and future. That's a visionary. I told you that does not work. And definitely not past only, present only, or future only. Those are the worst ones, and they don't work. So the way to do it is you anchor yourself in the past, in the present, and in the future. Now, do you know that the Bible says that Jesus is who? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So past, present, and future. He also says that he is the one that was, that is, and is to come. So past, present, and future. Can you see that this is the way to live your life? So let me break it down and show you exactly what that means. How do you anchor yourself in the past, in the present, and the future? This is what you need to do. Let me explain. So anchoring yourself in the past to start with is don't ever forget where you came from, how far God has brought you. If you have a tendency, if you are the kind of person that you are very quick to forget how far you've come, depression will come and build a house on top of that person's life. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, because you will look at what is, and you will be like, why is it? Because there's nothing in your life that's going to be hundred percent all of the time. You will always have something that you're progressively growing in. So that's how God made us. That is exactly how the Holy Spirit created us to be. He's always showing you things to come. He's always wanting to expand and increase and take territories, etc. So if you forget, you say, oh, I need this career. This I've not had a promotion in three years. I don't know what's going on. They've just blocked me at every board meeting. And you forget too that when you were starting your career, that in fact, you finished with third class. Not only did you finish with third class, you now searched and searched and then God helped you and you stood on the word and God opened the door miraculously. And since then, your career has just been flying. When you look back and see where you've come from and you see a job now that it may not be exactly where you want it to be, but you're like, whoa, compared to where I started from God, I'm so grateful. See, when you key into that, when you anchor yourself in the past, 
you will see how the Lord has helped you, how he has shown you mercy, how he has favored you when you didn't deserve it. And that in itself, when you begin to meditate on those experiences in your life, it automatically generates joy. This is something that I do every day, unless when I'm lazy, <laughs> when the lazy acts, not often, not often. Okay. But I have something called a book of remembrance. I've talked about this a few times on this podcast. We have actually a book of remembrance challenge in Saul. We take you through, I say, go and create your book of remembrance, give you exactly how to do it, et cetera, because I know how important this thing is. Periodically, I would go over my entire book of remembrance again and just begin to remember that, wow, see what God has done. See where I was. Do you see what I mean? So you go back. I have one key event or season in my life that every day, every day, nine out of 10 times, I go back. I begin my prayer time going back to that season and just giving God thanks. And just say, wow, God, see what you have done. My life could have gone anyhow, if not for you, God. Ah, if not for you. I mean, I look at my home, my family. I'm like, me that I started off, even you say, okay, even when I moved to this country, started off living in a single room bunk bed, bunk bed with my child. Do you understand? First, it was one small single bed and then there was a cot beside it for her to sleep in the two things took up the whole space in the room that was it then I, when she was a little bit older and she could come out of the cot i bought a two, i was not a 16 year old though that sharing bunk bed in a tiny single room and and i sit down i'm, I'm recording this podcast in my home office and I'm looking out and it's gorgeous. I'm looking out the window as I'm recording and it's beautiful. I'm surrounded by woodlands. It's a beautiful place, a beautiful house. Now, do I have a picture of a grander house that my family will live in that I know God is taking us to? Of course. Now, if I don't periodically go back to that single room that there was no space, how will I not be depressed? Do you see what I mean? Because you think, oh, you know, if you have a nice house, you will always be happy. <laughs> look at it's not true it's not true go and look at people that don't practice something like this you step into the house you be like wow i've seen this before step into someone's house like oh my goodness this house is so beautiful and they'll be like oh, no. we're looking to move i mean i'm just tired of this I'm, and they start complaining i'm like wow even with this beautiful house that you have you're still complaining that is human nature do you see what i mean human nature so you anchor yourself in the past by periodically. And when I say periodically, I don't mean once a year in December 31st. Every day, if you can, find one season or event in your life and always go back and say, ah, see what the Lord has delivered me from. See what the Lord has done. That's the first way. There are two ways to anchor yourself in the past. The second way to anchor yourself in the past is always be on alert and intentionally look for people in your environment whose present circumstances are your past are the things that god has delivered you from do you understand because it is so easy to get to a point in your life your present situation and you'll be like oh god look at but this is what i want to achieve oh god why isn't this happen why am i not married yet etc etc oh why is this husband behaving like this oh, blah, blah, blah. and you literally say why hasn't it changed but you forgot that you are somebody's vision board your life is somebody's vision board no matter how nonsense you think your life is current is somebody's vision board you may be complaining about that job and say see how they are treating me there's office politics they didn't promote me somebody just wants a job somebody's looking at you and saying wow i wish my career would look like that and you are complaining so you keep yourself grounded and anchored when you deliberately connect with people who's present circumstances are where you used to be and what do you do you don't just keep them there just to be making yourself feel better that ah i'm at least me i'm not like you no that's not what i'm saying i'm saying then reach out and actively help them reach out and pull them at least one or two steps forward do you see what i mean so that's how you do i need to move on now because of time 
So anchor yourself in the present now. Remember what I said, all three must be happening past, present, and future because Jesus is the one that was, that is, and is to come. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Three dimensions. For the present, this is what you do. Don't sweat the small stuff. Everything going on in your life right now that is making you pull your hair out a lot of times, I'm not saying, well, maybe I shouldn't say everything, but most of the time, in five years' time, it will not matter. In in, in five years, is even long. In six months' time, it won't be a problem again. It won't matter. So when you keep sweating the small stuff, like everything must be like this or whatever it is, it creates discouragement, dissatisfaction, and all those things. So what should you do instead? So this is what you're supposed to do. Pause as often as you can and quote and unquote, smell the roses. Enjoy the moments. Enjoy the moments. Yes, your family may not be perfect. But what is going on currently in your life that even though it's not perfect to that you can say, actually, this isn't that bad. I want to enjoy it. Like the children of Israel in the wilderness, eating manna every day. I can imagine them eating it every day and thinking, oh, man, this is nice, but I would love some nice grilled goat meat (laughs) to go with this manna and some nice jollof rice. Do you see what I mean? I, I, I get that. I can understand that. But the manna is what they have at the moment. So they could say, this manna is not, number one, is not permanent. It is not permanent. This season will change. But based on what it is now, it is not the best. It's not ideal. But what can I find? What can I enjoy out of this? And how do you do that? You give gratitude to God. Remember that joy is supplied by the Holy Spirit. So for you to be able to experience joy in the present, it has to be supplied by the Holy Spirit. And how does that happen with gratitude and thanksgiving? Yes, they keep calling me from school and saying that this child is not behaving well or my daughter is not achieving as she's supposed to be, etc., etc. And this is what you're saying. And as a result of that, you can't even enjoy that child. You can't have peace of mind or joy. It has so clouded your mind. But why not say this child is healthy? This child is well. Say, oh, the girl talks too much in school. At least she can talk. Do you see what I mean? Do you see? You say, oh, but developmental milestones. This child is not talking yet as they should. At least there's a child. Do Do you understand what I mean? Enjoy the child. Enjoy the job. Enjoy the husband. Enjoy what is by giving God thanks. So that's the second thing to anchor yourself in the present that must be going on. Giving gratitude to God for what is. For what is. No matter how quote unquote bad it looks, no situation is permanent. It will not always look like that. Embrace it and offer of thanksgiving to God. You're single, you say you want to get married and you have this vision of the future that you want. Hold on to that vision. But at the same time, say at the moment, what are the wonderful things about being single? I can go out when I want. I can literally travel at the drop of a hat and say, I'm going to go and see other countries. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can be of help. I can go and babysit. When you are married with your own kid, you probably will not have that liberty. So we say, what are the good things? What is God doing? What are the movements of God in this present time that I can offer up to God as a sacrifice of thanksgiving with gratitude? You will find joy in those things. Joy is ever present with you. The Bible says that in the presence of God, there's fullness of joy. And God is always present with you. Meaning you have an abundance of joy just sitting there waiting to be tapped into at every season of your life. No matter how much you've told yourself, no, there's nothing good about this season. I just want to be depressed. Do you understand? So that's how you do it. And finally, and finally, You anchor yourself in the future. You have to consistently put pictures. And when I say pictures, I don't just mean vision, but like in physical pictures. I mean in your mind, through your confession, through the promises of God that you're meditating on every day. Consistently put pictures of coming attractions in front of your eyes. 
Joshua and Caleb said, we are going into the promised land. They had rehearsed it so much that, listen, this is where we're heading. I can't die here. Through goal setting, you know how many people run away from goal setting? It baffles me, right? Like you, you don't even have something that you are deliberately reaching for. I mean, you're going to be depressed because you will keep waking up every day, be dissatisfied, and there's nothing that is showing you that something better is coming. You will be depressed. So you must have goals. You must have things to say, this is what's coming. This is where God is taking me. In your interactions with the Holy Spirit, the things that God is showing you, you write them that you document them. You write those promises down. You don't necessarily have to actively pursue them. I mean, there are things that God, he still showed me something like two days ago and I just packed it aside. He brought me joy because I'm like, wow, Father, I thank you. And I was so grateful for that promise and for that word that he showed me in his word. I don't even know how to actively pursue it. So I'm not going to actively pursue it, but to know somewhere in my mind that that's where I'm heading, it creates joy. It puts things in the right perspective. Do you understand that? So deliberately through goal setting, through just literally creating visions, writing down, documenting those visions. Another way to do that is surround yourself with people who literally are living the life that you want. So the people that are your own vision board connects with them. There's something about seeing that it's possible the same way Peter looked at Jesus walking on water and said, eh, you mean it's possible? Okay, bid me to come. And he stepped out. So deliberately reach out there. If you're single, connect with married people. Go and spend time with them. Literally, I've said this before on this podcast. It was one encounter with a married couple that reignited that vision in me for me as a single person to get married. Where marriage was concerned, I had completely written this. I, I did not have visions of marriage because I felt like I was like damaged goods or something like that. And it could never happen for me. So I'd written it off. So I was living in a perpetual state of dissatisfaction where marriage and relationships were concerned because I'm like, I'm written off. It can never happen for me. You, you understand what I mean? But I went to spend some time with some friends of mine. We went to university together and they met at university, got married, went to spend some time with them. And it just, I was like, wow, like a picture of a coming attraction. I'm like, Oh, and God basically spoke and I said, you can have this too. You're not exempt from this because of something that happened that many years ago. And that was what sparked it for me. And today, literally, I'm living that vision that I had all those years ago because I had a coming attraction that I kept in front of me. Do you see what I mean? So anchoring yourself in the future, have your goals written now. Set goals for goodness sakes. Don't just say, ah, what if I'm disappointed? The reason you set goals is not to say, oh, I want to achieve it. Listen, you set goals actually to start off by re-engineering your mind to even accept that vision. I hope you know that. In the beginning, you don't set goals to achieve the goals. If you set a goal and you go and try and achieve it, you will fall flat on your face and you'll be disappointed and say, I'm never setting goals again. No. In GEMS, is a whole curriculum on this. It is first to re-engineer, to rebuild, to recreate images that are distorted in your mind and replace them with accurate visions of your future. So if you constantly say, this is where God is taking me, this is what I know I'm going to achieve, it is good for your soul. It really is good for your soul, right? Where the people do not have a vision, it says they perish, they cast off restraint, they'll just be living anyhow, trapped in the pit of depression. And of course, secondly, as I said, is... Look for people that are your coming attractions and hang out with them. Hang out with them. Get in their space and let them continually show you what is possible. So my threefold cut principle to help you find joy in the present on your way to your preferred future is to anchor yourself in the past in the present and in the future at all times. Don't live in the past alone. Don't live in the future alone. Don't live in the present alone. Don't live in any combination of past and present or present and future. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, all right? So that's me done. I want to ask a favor. If you have anything you'd like me to cover on the podcast, then by all means, I would love, 
I honestly, I would love to hear from you. If you have a question, if there's something, a particular topic you want me to teach on, then please drop me an email, contact at olawumibrigway.com or on Instagram, olawumibrigway and let me know. I'll be more than happy to look into that. Thank you for joining the podcast and I'll be back. This is Olawumibrigway.